Euh, pour commencer, je regrette que le COVID m'a privé de l'opportunité de marquer le Brexit avec une visite à Paris, mais euh, je suis très heureux euh, d'être avec, avec vous euh, aujourd'hui de Manchester. OK, we begin with Peterloo um, on, on the first slide there. And I show this particular one because it shows both the Peterloo massacre of 1819, the 16th of August 1819 in Manchester, and its connection with the press, not just the radical press, but the press of all sorts. Um, Peterloo, you, you, Peterloo, you'll know about um, a, a large reform meeting that was attacked by, um, uh, uh, by troops uh, under the command of local magistrates with several hundred casualties and 18 deaths. And its bicentenary was celebrated or commemorated, I should say, very, very publicly with a great range of activities in Manchester uh, two years ago. Um, you'll notice that this picture has a number of letters on it. At the bottom, you can see B. Um, and on the trousers of the man just in the white hat who's being uh, arrested, you can see A. A is Henry Hunt, the famous orator. B is Joseph Johnson, with whom Hunt stayed in Manchester, and who was also um, involved uh, uh, mainly through finance with the Manchester Observer newspaper. Uh, C, further to the right, is uh, John Saxton, who was the chief reporter um, of the newspaper. You can just see him also being uh, arrested by a soldier at the side. And D is a female reformer, um, not, not John Saxton's wife, Susanna Saxton, but Susanna Saxton was part of the Manchester Society of Female Reformers and could easily have been on that platform as well. So three of the four named characters there are involved um, with the radical press. But there were many other reporters at Peterloo as well. On the platform were John Tyus of the Times, Richard Carlyle of the Radical Republican of, of, of London, and Charles Wright of the High Tory Courier. Charles Wright was busy giving information to the authorities as well as reporting. Uh, somewhere in the audience were uh, new, other, other newspapers from London, from Leeds, from Liverpool, several Manchester uh, reporters. Um, Two or three of them were injured, um, Tyus and Saxton were both imprisoned, and so Peterloo was an event in the national coverage, uh, press coverage of a regional event, uh, as well as uh, an event in radical politics. Okay, the Manchester Observer then. Um, there it is, the ma three mastheads, as they're called, the, the, the titles of the newspaper. The newspaper went through various, um, various iterations, but it lasted in all for about five years on and off. The Manchester Observer didn't merely report, but it actively shaped the radical campaigns of these years. And in fact, the Observer Group was the principal organiser of the Peterloo meeting of the 16th of August 1819. And it was both organiser and defendant in the campaign for justice that followed. At its peak in 1819-20, to 20, around the time of Peterloo, the Manchester Observer had the highest circulation of any Manchester newspaper, which was about 4,000. In fact, that was the highest circulation of any provincial newspaper outside London as well. And with probably seven or eight readers per copy, because it was passed around and read in groups because of its price, it was probably read by 30,000 people. There are a lot of connections between London and Manchester at this period in the radical movement. The press, um, the Manchester Observer circulated in London and reports from the London papers were printed in the Manchester Observer. There was circulation of news. There was connections between London and Manchester through radical publishing at both ends. The radical campaign of 1819 was a national campaign. The Manchester meeting was the uh, largest single episode in it and the one that everybody particularly looked to, but it was part of a campaign of more than uh, a dozen uh, large mass meetings, including meetings in London and all over the country. And also there was a campaign against the radical press, which was also national. It was conducted by the government who worked through uh, the various local authorities who, did, who usually did the prosecutions on the ground. John Saxton, um, late in the Manchester Observer's career, wrote in an editorial in September 1821, London has been called the stronghold of the liberty of the press, but Manchester is assuredly the centre and stronghold of the parliamentary reformers. And I think this sums up something very important. Although the London radicals, uh, who are mostly ultra radicals, those who were involved with the, with the mass movement, 
uh, had a very high profile, they weren't actually very effective and they only were able intermittently to, to produce meetings. Um, on the other hand, the radical movement was it had a very much stronger community base uh, in the northwest of England, particularly the Manchester region. On the other hand, in, 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 in Lancashire, the Manchester press was very much under the, uh, uh, under the thumb of some very high Tory authorities, whereas in London, the press was relatively independent and juries consistently failed to convict uh, uh, writers and publishers for seditious publications. Uh, so this was a useful alliance, but also a way of government, as we'll see later, to, to use um, the, the uh, power of the, the courts in the provinces to get at publications that were published in London. OK, Peterloo briefly, and this is probably the most famous single image of Peterloo, a peaceful rally for parliamentary reform on St Peter's Fields, Manchester, on the 16th of August, 1819. To, it's usually said there were 50 to 60,000 people. I think I would probably revise that downwards to, to, to 40,000 and perhaps even further. Processions came from all over the region to hear Henry Hunt, a well-known national orator. It was dispersed by troops under the command of the local magistrates who were considerably more um, hawkish and militant um, than the government itself, which is saying a lot. 18 died, almost 700 were seriously injured. Four years after the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, which was an extremely bloody victory and a bloody episode in which many, many uh, troops had been, been killed. It was not, a, not, a, not celebrated in the same way that the naval victory of Trafalgar was celebrated. But four years after Waterloo, uh, the attack on St. Peter's Fields was dubbed Peterloo by the local Manchester Observer and the label stuck. Um, I had in the book this diagram, this map of the Manchester region which I think is important. I think a lot of people in the south of England, they get the impression that Manchester was a very large industrial city extending for, for miles all, all over the region, uh, completely controlled by um, uh, capitalists in top hats and factory masters. The truth is very different. Manchester and Salford, there were twin towns either side of a, of a river, um, were at the center of a large region, um, which was a, a whole, a co the cotton districts, if you like. Um, to the north, to the east, and to the southeast, you can see the upland areas. These were areas of handloom weaving. The cotton factories, the spinning factories, which made um, cotton into thread, were mostly in Manchester. There was very little power loom weaving at all at this period. Most of the experiments had actually failed. And weaving was done almost entirely by handloom weavers, many of them in cellars in, in, in Manchester, but most of them in the surrounding country districts. And the, the people in the country districts, the weavers regularly traveled in and out of Manchester to bring their, to pick up their, their thread and to bring in their finished cloth. And they would have come into Manchester, talked, met in the markets, met in the pubs and read the Manchester Observer and picked up political and other news. So the Peterloo gathering was a regional gathering and the majority of people there uh, were from outside Manchester, maybe 50-50. And by far the biggest occupational group were handling weavers and not factory workers. Handling weavers made up about 40% of, uh, of the adult male casualties of Peterloo. Cotton factory workers made up only about 5% of the casualties. And you can see here a handloom. And from the, from the graphic novel, which I was pleased to be involved with, Peterloo Witnesses to a Massacre, this is an image of what the weaving districts were like, you know, a few kilometres from Manchester. And you can see a procession passing uh, from a, a distant town or large village into Manchester on the 16th of August with flags and banners. So it was not a large urban factory based event. In fact, the factory workers were locked in their factories, were not allowed to come out. Manchester itself was a very mixed town. This image from 1819 shows a new Georgian fashionable bridge which had not yet been built. Behind it, you can see riverside warehouses, but you can also see there are a lot of very poor cellar dwellings and flooded dwellings here. And you can also see Manchester Cathedral, which is a symbol of the fact that Manchester was also a very old town governed by a high Tory elite and a completely unreformed local government. Manchester is often identified as an advanced factory town and people think of Manchester liberalism and advanced liberal politics. But in fact, at this period, Manchester was a totally unimproved um, town in terms of local government and, and governance had, and had one of the most reactionary and corrupt local government elites in, in the country. This is the urban area as it was in 1819, only about two kilometres across altogether. 
Um, most of the factories were on the outskirts of the town towards the south and the east. And right in the center, the cathedral, uh, the, uh, its name was officially the Collegiate Church, St. Peter's Fields in the south on the edge of the town center, and right in the middle, the exchange, the corn exchange, the trading exchange, the commercial heart of Manchester. That's the building as it was in 1819. And you can see just, I think on your left, uh, one or two small buildings and what either one of those or very close by was the offices of the Manchester Observer. So it was right in the center of Manchester, defying the, the grandest uh, building of the Manchester cotton trade. The Times just before Peterloo reported that the shop of Rowe, the printer of the Manchester Observer, is at Sedition Corner, beset with poor misled creatures whose attitude for seditious ribaldry, created at first by distress, is wetted by every species of stimulating novelty. Medusas, Gorgons, Black Dwarfs, the names of the unstamped newspapers of the period, are heaped on the table or in windows with hideous profusion. This was John Tyus of the Times, who later wrote a highly um, powerful and, and critical account of the, of the Peterloo meeting and the authorities' attack on it. Okay, newspapers in the UK in 1818. We happily have an article that was written round about the time that counted up the number of newspapers. Those which were officially stamped as newspapers, and I'll come to that in a moment, were 170 in England and Wales, nearly a third of them in London, which accounted for two thirds of the sales, and uh, about two thirds of them in the provinces, which accounted for um, only one third of the sales. The typical provincial newspaper had a sale of fewer than a thousand. Two sevenths of, the, of them were fiercely pro-government and wouldn't hear a word against it. Uh, you might think of them as Trumpite newspapers now. Um, th three sevenths were moderately pro-government and it was reckoned that two sevenths were in some degree independent from Whig to one or two radical newspapers, but still often dependent on government advertising. The typical price of a newspaper was seven pence, which was, you know, almost as much as a poor labourer, a very poor labourer might earn in a day. Of that, fourpence was the stamp tax. It was illegal to publish news of any kind unless you printed it on paper, which was pre-stamped with this government stamp, which you can see with the uh, symbols of England and Wales, the, the rose, uh, the shamrock and the thistle, and the royal, um, uh, the royal motto of Dieu et mon droit. So those were the official stamped newspapers of which the Manchester Observer was one. There were very few independent newspapers. Cobbett's Political Register is well known. That was also a stamped newspaper. I think it retailed for a shilling, which was very expensive. And three um, radical newspapers in the provinces, including the Manchester Observer, all in the north of England. This is how they were printed. You might recognise a still from the film of Peterloo. Um, printing newspapers was pretty much a handmade craft production. The presses with two people working and not one as you see here could turn out at most 200 copies an hour. Their setup costs were modest, they were cheap to buy, but the cost of newspapers was, was massively increased by the various taxes on paper, on adverts, and then the stamp duty. And paying stamp duty was the legal definition of a newspaper. And it reflected the government's idea that the circulation of news should be restricted to propertied citizens with a legitimate, le legitimate interest in public affairs. And the stamp duty was set high because as one prime minister said, reading news, the news was a species of luxury that ought to be taxed. As for levels of literacy, round about three quarters of male artisans and one third of common laborers and servants in this period were literate. Literacy levels probably went down in the Industrial Revolution, especially in the North. It's often assumed that they must have gone up, but in fact, print was now as expensive relative to wages as it had ever been, and literacy was falling in, in a lot of the North, partly because of government restrictions on, on, the, on the price and circulation of publications. It was only in the 1820s and 30s that we got a boom in cheap printing. The Church of England Sunday Schools, founded in 1800, the, the, the National Alliance, rather, of Church of England Schools, deliberately did not teach writing, only reading. So although we talk about this wonderful new organisation to educate the people, in fact, there were many Sunday schools that taught reading and writing. The Church of England was trying to prevent the teaching of writing. It was only necessary to read the Bible, but not learn how to write sedition. 
in, in towns, urban towns such as Stockport, which had very good Sunday schools, uh, literacy could be boosted, but there were many migrants from, from rural areas in the cities who had fairly low literacy. It was a constant theme of loyalist politicians at national level and, and below that newspapers um, were basically amplifying the voices and indeed encouraging voices of sedition and rebellion. They were, said the Home Secretary, Lord Sidmouth, a former Prime Minister, the most malignant and former enemy to the Constitution. The lawyer charged with defending the Pentridge rebels, rebels of 1817 explained in their defence that they had been led astray by a malignant and diabolical newspaper distributed by poor, miserable hawkers or peddlers. The newspaper in question was the cheap edition of William Cobbett's weekly political register, which Cobbett proudly marketed as the Tuppany Trash. And in the autumn of 1816, the cheap edition of Cobbett's political register was a great breakthrough in newspaper publishing. What Cobbett essentially did was to take the editorial section, that is his own um, personal commentary, out of the middle of the newspaper, uh, to leave the news, news the news was only in this expensive stamp version, and the long editorial section, Cobbett's commentary, was marketed separately for the price of tuppence, unstamped. Because it was opinion and not news, it was not liable to be stamped. And the circulation of this exploded on the 2nd of November with an edition that was entirely devoted to Cobbett's address to the journeyman labourers of England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland, uh, urging them to support the cause of reform. And because this was reprinted in pamphlet form, it probably circulated 40 to 50,000 copies. Cobbett's distribution system for these cheap public, for, for his register, and for many other publications that shared the same channels with it, was peddlers, uh, uh, local hawkers and sellers. And so, so which created a whole, um, it, it tapped into the, the market for extremely cheap popular publications. And in March 1817, the government sent out an order to prosecute the peddlers who were selling blasphemous and seditious pamphlets and writings. To, pub, to prosecute a peddler for selling something seditious, you do not need to prove it was seditious, merely demonstrate that it might be or sounded seditious. Then there was the unstamped press. It's been reckoned that in 1818 there were 123 unstamped newspapers. The most famous was the Black Dwarf, founded in 1817 following Cobbett by Thomas Buller of London, which circulated at still quite a high price of fourpence. I think without, with no tax and fourpence, Wooler was making more money out of each copy than the stamp newspapers were making at, at sevenpence. Another well-known ones were Sherwin's, Sherwin's Political Register, the Republican of Richard Carlyle, the London trade newspaper, the Gorgon. And uh, you've got this, uh, this famous image of the printing press as the tyrant's foe, the people's friend. And the unstamped press were described as weekly political essayists, Cobbett, Wooler, Sherwin, who form a body of light troops in the popular interest. We often call these unstamped things the unstamped press and newspapers, but they were really only commentary. As you can see from this um, poster advert for the Black Dwarf, uh, the London Black Dwarf, it didn't print news. The numbers contain reasons for the assemblage at Manchester. Death is preferable to starvation. Hint somewhere to find corn in Egypt for the poor. And this was a, for the poor. This was a, a polemic about food prices. An appeal to the bees against the drones in, in, in the city, clearly a, an allegory for the exploited poor. Strange tales for old women. Infamous treatment of Bonaparte. Theatricals and the comments from the black dwarf to the yellow bonds. These, fictional characters who sent, the Yellow Bonds was a Chinese figure and the Black Dwarf was his English correspondent who sent a kind of disguised commentary on these ridiculous affairs that the English were up to. Um, so it was, a, it was a kind of disguised political satire, but it did not carry news. It would occasionally carry letters commenting on things which had happened, but it did not carry direct news reports or, or anything of that kind. The Manchester Observer was different. Um, this, is an, this is the front page of the first issue. The front page normally was adverts, but this is devoted to its editorial uh, announcement to the public. Uh, and it's announced it would be an independent journal conducted on constitutional principles in a firm and temperate manner, neither imposed upon my names nor influenced by factions, highly acceptable to the statesman and the philosopher and to manufacturing and 
and commercial interest. So it started as fairly upmarket, and you can see there are adverts for tutors, um, for a seminary for, 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 for ladies and for a mathematician. Um, and there are also, in the early days, adverts like this one, uh, where some ladies are gossiping about the wonderfully cheap uh, dresses and materials that can be bought at the Wellington House Drapers. Um, this is for Fabrice, bargain fashion spread virally by gossip. This is uh, Au Bonheur de Dame, uh, 60 years or so before Zola. But this uh, character of the newspaper soon changed. The first proprietor from its beginning in January 1818 right through to January 1819 was Mark Wardle, um, who was an existing publisher. He managed to sell a lot of copies to publicans in Manchester, Stockport and Bolton, who, who made it available to their, um, uh, to, their, uh, to their customers and built up a fairly good circulation in Manchester and with agents in the surrounding towns. Um, publicans were threatened with loss of their licenses if they stopped their Manchester Observer, so they were always taking a risk if they did this. The Home Office very soon urged the Manchester authorities to prosecute Wardle, the editor, for libel. And you can see here that this particular copy has been bought by, uh, brought at the Ma at Mark Wardle's printing office by uh, William, Sh by, by Mr Shawcross, 8th of August 1818. In other words, this was being bought by the authorities almost every week as evidence of libel or quite sometimes as evidence that they were not paying their stamp duty. Um, and there's a big X on the account of the Rochdale meeting, which is thought to be possibly uh, libelous. Wardle in early 1819 was finally arrested at the office and was bound over to appear in the King's Bench in London at the Eastern Law term for what he was called was a libel on government. By the Lord, exclaimed Wardle, it is a libel to call it a government. In the end, Wardle was forced to sell up to some of his political rivals um, on the left, um, not just by prosecution, but by the, by the fact that he'd fallen into debt for, for stamp duty and for advertisement duty. He was also an alcoholic. He was being blackmailed by magistrates into revealing some of his sources, uh, which we know from the Home Office private correspondence he did do. And his control of his paper was already being uh, challenged by, by radicals who eventually took it over. The person who bought it immediately though, um, in uh, early 1819, was Thomas Chapman, a Manchester businessman, whom you can see um, in this satirical print from Manchester. Henry Hunt is, is, uh, is uh, going on his carriage um, over to be tried, in, or perhaps coming back from being tried in, in York. And uh, to the left of Hunt with the keys and the hat is Chapman, um, fruiter, dealer and Chapman. Chapman means common peddler. So that was a, a pun on his name. Actually, he was quite a wealthy man. And on the other side, raising his hat with the brush is Joseph Johnson, the brush maker, who was funding the, uh, the, Man the, the Manchester Observer. Chapman was a police commissioner and very hot on local government corruption, so he was very soon prosecuted for libeling the town officers and the contractors in the gas company. We know the foulness of the stable, said Chap Chapman, but we will cleanse it or perish in the attempt. Manchester is the most infamously abused town in the kingdom. Chapman too was forced to sell his newspaper by prosecution. Later, after when he eventually came to trial, he was forced out of public life bankrupt and broken by imprisonment, although he was an extremely tough character. But not before he had chaired protest meetings after Peterloo and offered vital financial support to his successor who bought the Manchester Observer, uh, which was, who was James Rowe. We don't have a picture of James Rowe, um, but here he is in the, in the uh, Peterloo film, you may recognize him. Rowe was already a bookseller in Manchester, so he had his own bookshop um, up in what's now the Northern Quarter near what's now Piccadilly Station, the working class factory area. And at the same time, he had the Observer office right in the town centre. Um, Rowe visited London fairly regularly to uh, uh, sell his own publications, even before he was editor of the Observer. Um, uh, but also to bring London publications back to Manchester to order them and to make contact with the book trade. Uh, and he dropped into Richard Carlyle's office, the office of the, of the Republican. Richard Carlyle had helped Henry Hunt a few months before when Hunt stood uh, as a, in the election for MP for Westminster. Hunt didn't get anywhere, but Carlyle had helped have make for him a large cap of liberty, 
uh, a large thing tin lined, a, a very large one, uh, with, with the slogan Hunt and Liberty on it. And Roe asked Carlyle whether he could take that up back up to Manchester, because it was obvious that Roe um, Ro was already thinking of inviting Henry Hunt to address a meeting in Manchester. So the Cap of Liberty that was a, a um, the big one that was displayed on the platform at Manchester had actually come from Henry Hunt's election campaign at, at London. Uh, we can also see on the picture here, the figure you saw on the right of the picture, um, John Saxton, who was uh, James Rowe's um, chief uh, reporter in Manchester and did much of the writing for the Observer. Henry Hunt did come to Manchester and addressed a meeting in St Peter's Fields uh, seven months before the famous uh, Peterloo meeting. And then he visited the theatre, the stronghold of loyalism of the Manchester establishment, very quickly got into a brawl with some hussars, some of the regular cavalry, uh, famous for their uh, smart blue Prussian style uniforms and their moustaches, which were quite unusual in this period, except on hussars. And uh, Hunt refused to take his hat off when the national anthem was played and the, the brawl broke out um, in Hunt's box. Hunt had actually taken an expensive box, normally reserved for, for the local, um, uh, uh, local gentry in the establishment. So that was quite a provocative thing to do as well. And here you can see Hunt is towards the right, raising his cane with his hat labelled uh, Liberty. And also with him, with his back to us, Sir Joseph Johnson again. Uh, biting the arm of one of the hussars is Nicholas Whitworth, who was also a, a, a silent secret supporter of the radical press in Manchester. And on the left is Thomas Chapman, um, the, the, the then proprietor about to, about to give over. So the Manchester Observer, the press is important in Hunt's first visit to Manchester. And here is the Observer office uh, in a scene from the Peterloo film, which I think you can get on, on Amazon Prime, who, who funded it. Uh, on the, on the right, you can see uh, Saxton sitting down, Rowe standing up, standing opposite us, Joseph Johnson, who's dropped in to check on his investments. And on the left, John Knight, a veteran radicals, a small cotton manufacturer from Oldham, now based in, in Manchester. All of them quite important characters in the film. So the Observer Office was in many ways the headquarters of Manchester uh, radicalism. And it's interesting to note that the leading figures were not themselves working class figures, they were small manufacturers, small businessmen who were completely outside uh, the very tight knit loyalist Manchester establishment. Well, here is the Observer from June 1819, not long after Rowe and Saxton had finally taken it over. And you can see they are advertising Voltaire's Philosophical Dictionary, Sherwin's Life of Thomas Paine, and they're also advertising public meetings at Stockport and in Ashton Underline. The Ashton meeting was reported on inside um, the newspaper. Um, let me see where I am. Yeah. Um, and it was reported on by probably by Saxton himself, who reported on his own speech. Um, and the report goes like this. An amazing concourse of people crowded the roads in every direction. It was a welcome sight to witness a whole population embark with heart and hand in the common cause and the steady and firm demeanor indicated that one sentiment universally pervaded the whole. This struck terror into the host of their oppressors. This is clearly a report designed to give, to give confidence and strength to the radicals, not only those at the meeting, but those who are reading about it in the newspaper. Who, 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 so the, the message of the meeting is massively amplified. The chair announced that there would, the meeting would make a solemn appeal to the people of England to join with them in reclaiming their ancient constitutional right to vote, founded on the principles of eternal justice and the rights of man. So English radicalism is very much a mixture of English constitutionalism and the claim that the original English constitution was in line with the rights of man. Saxton then spoke and he explained to the crowd that he now held a confidential situation in the office of the most independent newspaper in the kingdom, the Manchester Observer, and he was authorised to say that the columns of the journal would periodically publish an important communication to the people of England. He said if the reformers of England can but be induced to assemble in their districts in one day, they will then speak in a voice of thunder and ministers will be made to caper before the tribunal of the people to a different tune. He warned the crowd and therefore his readers that there was a plan to seize the cap of liberty by the yeomanry and take it from the people at the point of the sword. But he said he would give them to understand that um, he would defend the ensign and banner 
under which he stood even at the very cannon, uh, cannon's mouth. And in the report, he gives himself very loud huzzas. And then after exhorting the people to firmness and good order, Mr. Saxton retired amidst, of course, rapturous applause. So his aim was to raise the crowd and through a press, raise the, raise his, rouse his supporters, and then through appealing to, to, uh, uh, to all the readers, including readers in London and elsewhere in the provinces, to rouse the nation. It's quite a, a striking vision of the power of the press. The Observer at this period had a circulation, and this was its peak period, of about 4,000 or 30,000 readers, as I said. It had distributors all over the north of England, one typically in every main industrial town. There were also two distributors in London, uh, but only two stamped newspapers, which might copy uh, the appeal to the people of England. The Manchester Observer was read at meetings, it was read in pubs, and it was read out loud by people to each other because of its expense. When several radicals were arrested for drilling, the military drilling near Bolton, the local magistrate reported to the Home Office that one of the prisoners confessed that he got his reforming notions from the Manchester Observer, which it seems he was in the habit of reading for the information of his neighbours. From this corrupt source, he said, has flowed in this country a considerable proportion of the disaffection that prevails. As we'll see a little bit later, I think that there's the very strong typography of parts of the Observer and also the very typography that you see in a lot of radical publications with a lot of bold, a lot of capital letters, italics and exclamation marks. I think it's like that because it's made to show readers where they can emphasize, where they can speak out, of loud, loud, out, of, out loud easily and emphasize, and actually to turn readers into orators, almost despite their limited reading abilities. The Manchester Observer now positioned itself as, I think we'll leave with that one, as the central organ of the national radical movement, articulating and amplifying the voice of the people. Through it, the voice of the people reached the Home Office, which learned of the preparations for the meeting from its columns. The magistrates too continued to find it uh, useful as evidence for sedition. The Home Office recommended it to Major General Bing, the military commander for the Northern District, as a source of advice on which he could act for the arrangement of his forces. Bing called it my weekly plague. Some weeks he forwarded his copy to the Home Office and other weeks um, he said, I've always burnt the Manchester Observer so that nobody in my house shall read it. From the moment Rowe took over the paper from Chapman and Wardle, the Home Office were determined to close it down. Copies were bought and looked at in case they were, had not paid their stamp duty. On one occasion, the Home Office, the, Home Office, the magistrates bought 50 copies of, an uns, of a, the unstamped Manchester Observer, um, unstamped copies in, in, in the hope of prosecuting it, although they didn't in the end. The Observer's report on the Ashton meeting, which I've just quoted, um, was referred to government lawyers who said that although it was certainly libelous, it was unlikely that a jury would actually convict it. The Observer gained a scoop in, Janu in July of 1819, a, a month before the Peterloo meeting, with an accurate report from the inside source that the Yeomanry, the Man volunteer Manchester Yeomanry, had sent their sabres for sharpening in advance, and it carried a ferocious attack, ridiculing the Manchester the Yeomanry as boobies and toy soldiers who would doubtless be resisted by the brave reformers of Manchester. This mockery may well have accounted for the fierceness with which the Yeomanry attacked at Manchester. As one soldier attacked the crowd near the platform, he was heard to shout, I'll show you I'm a soldier today. Rowe was arrested a few days after this by police runners who expressed their infernal satisfaction at having got possession of their prey and dragged him like a felon through the streets. However, he was bailed out. Uh, that is, he was, he was, uh, uh, money was put up to allow him to be freed on good behaviour for a total of a thousand pounds, which astonished the magistrates who could hardly believe uh, that the supporters of radicals could be so wealthy. Because he'd been arrested, Rowe Ro was then in hiding for nine weeks and he wasn't actually at the Manchester meeting, but a dozen other reporters were, as we saw, including Saxton. There's that villain Saxton, run him through, cried one of the yeomanry. The Saxon escaped with a small flesh wound to the leg. The loyalist, loyalist reporter Charles Wright uh, was beaten up by mistake for Saxton by special constables. Jeremiah Garnett, the reporter for the moderately loyal Manchester Chronicle, um, only escaped a beating after threatening his assailant with pistols. 
John Tyus of the London Times was on the platform, was arrested in mistake for a Manchester reporter and imprisoned overnight. And Tyus's famous report came out three days later uh, and turned opinion against the Manchester authorities, as did reports in the Leeds and Liverpool newspapers. The Observer report on Peterloo was eagerly awaited by huge crowds, not least by an artillery officer who had been present. He wrote to the Home Office, I intend to send you that scoundrel Rose paper if I can get it. But the shop has been surrounded since daylight this morning. They are sold as fast as they can be printed. Hundreds are waiting to take them to the country. The following Saturday, Rowe issued a new unstamped pamphlet called Peterloo Massacre, which was dedicated to providing extra evidence, all the evidence that there wasn't room for in the newspaper of the events of the 16th of August, without a stamp, of course. He explained, in the course of the work will be given all the public placards which were issued previous to the tragedy, every authentic document that can be procured that exhibits in their true colours the authors, abettors and actors in the drama of death. The friends of the murdered and wounded people are requested to furnish the editor at the Observer office with accurate statements. And the paper later, later published this satire as well on the magistrates who claimed that they had read the riot act uh, to warn people before the attack, although nobody actually heard it read. And here's one magistrate, uh, like a cuckoo clock, uh, allegedly reading the riot act. 14 numbers of this um, cheap publication uh, were published and later bound into book, book form. Uh, it concluded the names of all of those injured, which were also posted in the windows of the Observer Office, along with the names of those yeomanry who were allegedly responsible, further testing the laws of libel. In October, the Observer announced, we despise the taunts and threats of our oppressors. The Observer has a circulation superior to any provincial journal in the kingdom and exceeds that of all the other Manchester newspapers put together, which was true. This is it which angers our authorities, but it will only increase our sale. We tell them to do their worst. We have bail for a thousand libels at our command. The Home Office uh, was told, it is said there are as many as 6,000 papers published weekly. And on the day of publication, it's not uncommon for the shop to be shut while new editions are printed. There is always a crowd around the, around the door to receive the papers or look at the satires in the window. The paper also branched out further into visual representations of Peterloo as part of its work of recording what happened. And this is from the 23rd of October. Um, and you can get it in the online Manchester Observer, which I'll point you to a, a little bit later on. Um, this is a full play, page plan of St Peter's Fields. More than a map, it was a detailed visual account and almost a kind of moving graphic, moving picture of what happened, complete with a 21 point key um, to the event based on evidence collected by solicitors who were investigating the episode on behalf of the Metropolitan uh, Committee of Inquiry. It showed not only the layout of the area, but the sequence of events, which direction the processions came from, which direction the troops came from, and the troops attacking, fleeing protesters. And some of the detail is really quite tiny. As you can see here, rows of soldiers blocking the exit on the left, and, and tiny protesters being attacked by tiny soldiers. And you can see some of the women, possibly one or two, are very young. And the, 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 uh, the key says these are the Manchester Yeomanry cutting at men and women heaped on each other before the houses and foot soldiers and dragoons striking and intercepting fugitives. And afterwards, the Manchester Observer issued this print of um, the whole um, of the whole of the dispersal of the meeting. But it's quite interesting this print because as in the as in the map, and I think this is essentially meant to be a pick, an upmarket pictorial representation of the map, this shows all the buildings in, in roughly their correct places. But you can also see all the events of the meeting happening, but things that happened at different periods are all in one place. So you can see uh, the column of soldiers marching in towards the platform. You can see on the right, the same cavalry yeomanry perhaps surrounding the platform and arresting Henry Hunt. Then you can see them attacking the flags and the banners around Hunt's carriage. Uh, and then you can also see them dispersing the crowd, the crowd fleeing over towards the edge of the field and the crowd attacking individuals, including these famous images of, of troops um, attacking defenseless women and even children. It's a kind of bon dessine, but all in a single frame. It is sequential art, but in one frame. Peterloo brought London and Lancashire radicals together closer, at least for a time. The London publisher Richard Carlyle was on the platform at Peterloo and returned to publish an inflammatory report in his journal, The Republican. 
He was later jailed for a year on supposedly unrelated, or several years in fact, on supposedly unrelated charges of blasphemous libel. Rowe made his own journey to the capital afterwards to negotiate closer cooperation with the London ultra radicals who now dominated the movement there. Uh, this group of Spencean radicals regularly took the Manchester Observer and read it at their meeting, weekly meetings in Soho. The Manchester Observer advertised some of the short-lived unstamped uh, London newspapers which were published after Peterloo, the White Hat, the Medusa and so on. And it's also carried an account of the protest meeting organised by London reformers against Peterloo, which resolved that the resolution to this meeting be inserted in the Manchester Observer. After that, however, relations between the London and Manchester radicals deteriorated. The London Ultra promoted a plan for simultaneous protest meetings across the country in the autumn, which would, it would certainly have been impossible for, all, for the troops to police all of them at one time. The aim was to issue simultaneous ultimatums to the government to, to pass parliamentary reform, and then to reconvene two or three weeks later uh, to be told that they'd been refused and to stage mass marches towards the capital and perhaps an uprising. Arthur Thistlewood, the future Cato, conspirator, Cato Street conspirator, the campaign to us, the, the, the plot to assassinate the cabinet in early 1820, came to the north to gather support. But Henry Hunt issued a, a call to his supporters to ignore the call for simultaneous meetings. He was supported by Rowe and the Manchester Observer, um, who regarded it as a, as a provocation by spies, and they may well have been right. The meetings or despite the many independent protest meetings in the north of England, despite the intense anger about Peterloo, the plan for simultaneous meetings were a complete flop. Almost not, hardly any of the meetings took place and there were only a handful of people. And I think the fact that people didn't come to these meetings is a powerful testimony to the power of the radical press. In October of 1819, the editor James Rowe was again arrested for libel. He was, he was given bail on several, he was, the bail for the several charges was £600 for each charge. To the astonishment of the magistrates, again, four businessmen appeared in court to stand bail. The scene was almost novel, even in a Manchester court, reported the observer. Gentlemen of very great respectability in property and in character as any person on the bench were cross-questioned as though they had been paupers seeking relief from parish, from the parish. Having demonstrated that they, he, they could indeed pay bail of £3,000 if Roe absconded, Roe refused to pay the port, court costs and walk free. The next day, several members of his own family and a number of shop staff were prosecuted for selling seditious publications, including his own 10-year-old son, David, who was charged with he being, that he, being a wicked and evil-disposed person, did with force of arms attempt to excite and stir up sedition, disaffection and rebellion. He was eventually fined sixpence as a lesson to him. The shop assistant was jailed for four months, the wife of the printer was jailed for six months, and the printer's daughter was fined five pounds for taking a newspaper off the shelf and passing it to her mother to sell. Rowe and his own family members were sent on trial on more serious charges to the county assizes uh, about um, 70 kilometres to the north in Lancaster. News agents and paper sellers who took the Observer were intimidated the observer's office was regularly attacked by the yeomanry and bore the marks of yeomanry sabres in its woodwork. In this post-Peterloo period, prosecutions of press and publishers was moved out of London to the provinces and especially to the north of England. London juries would not convict because of these, uh, they simply wouldn't convict. However, the government was able to support local magistrates in harassing peddlers, booksellers and so on. Um, if you could prosecute one or two, Others would simply be intimidated to not stocking radical publications. Manchester law was notorious for always convicting people and Lancashire juries were also notorious for being extremely loyal. And the Home Office also used legal means known as ex officio proceedings to effectively take control of trials themselves, to manage them themselves, uh, to bring in special juries who are more likely to convict. And then they would return the, call, the, the courts to the local courts to be tried by local juries. Uh, the Home Office even considered actually trying to prosecute the Times of London in Lancashire for libels written in London but circulated in Lancashire but they decided that uh, it was probably a bad idea. At the end of, I beg your pardon, I haven't got a, a slide explaining the the details of the six acts of, of at the end passed at the end of uh, 1819. Um, but the six acts um, 
they were famously the seditious meetings act was there to stop people meeting in any large numbers without permission to stop them marching and rallying and, and doing any style of military style drilling but there are also three further acts which which uh, which were equally important to confine the press uh to um uh particularly to make sure that, that uh, people could not put off their trials to other courts and, and so on to tighten the, the, the conditions for bail and so on. Um, and in particular, the um, Newspaper Stamp Duties Act extended the stamp duty to unstamped newspapers. If you printed commentary, that effectively counted as news and you had to pay stamp duty. That immediately killed the unstamped newspapers, but of course the Manchester Observer was able to continue. The Black Dwarf in London turned itself into a stamped newspaper and also continued this time with news. The Manchester authorities kept adding charges to the Manchester Observer until Rowe eventually faced no fewer than 11. He kept the paper going until February 1820, but he eventually admitted to his readers that he'd been ruined by the cost of the defence and the fear and terror with which my friends have been seized from the supposed operation of the late Acts of Parliament. Overwhelmed by his troubles, Rowe sold the newspaper to the London radical editor, Thomas Evans Jr who moved to Manchester to edit it. Um, the, at the York Peterloo trial the following March 1820, uh, there was a lot of mention made of the Manchester Observer. It was claimed that the defendants and many of the, the, the radicals at Peterloo had been corrupted by reading the Manchester Observer and the Manchester Observer had actually been responsible for spreading seditious words and, 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 and inciting riot. Um, uh, not all of those claims were successful, but Hunt was nonetheless convicted and then uh, a couple of weeks later, the same judges moved to Lancaster to, to try Rowe and the Manchester Observer at the Lancashire Assizes. Uh, Rowe was found guilty on two sample charges in jail for 12 months. His wife and two brothers were found guilty and bound over for good behaviour in very large sums. But Rowe had managed to resist long enough for his newspaper to continue and he sold it on to Thomas Evans, uh, the, the, one of the London ultra radicals who had some publishing experience. Um, he'd been one of the Spensians, in fact, but he'd broken with the Spensians because uh, when they turned to conspiracy, Thomas John Evans and his father, Evans Senior, believed in education rather than conspiracy. Rather than conspiracy. Evans was as defiant as, James, as uh, Rowe had been. He promised that his observer would continue Rowe's fearless policies, recording every instance of magisterial oppression. The struggle, he said, had come down to slavery or revolution, and he intended to use the newspaper as a channel of communication between the radicals of the London and the North and to make it the first provincial Cirque journal in the empire. Notwithstanding these ambitions, uh, the new circulation declined. It had been about 2000 when Rowe handed it over. A few months later, it had fallen to 700. Evans campaigned vigorously against the presence of troops in Lancashire, libeled them to his heart's content and himself in turn was eventually overwhelmed uh, by prosecution and Evans, sold it on to Thomas John Wooler, proprietor of the Black Dwarf and editor of the Black Dwarf. Um, the Black Dwarf was now a stamped newspaper. Wooler was actually in prison, um, having been in prison for, for, seditious, for, for seditious libel himself. So he was the proprietor of the paper from prison in London. The editor in practice in Manchester was um, John Thacker Saxton, again, James Rose um, editor and chief reporter. Um, by now, the circulation of the Manchester Observer had, had, had gone down a lot, but wrote, uh, Saxton and Wooler between them continued to campaign for justice for the victims of Peterloo uh, for inquiries and even helped support a, 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 a prosecution to make a, take a civil prosecution uh, against members of the Manchester Yeomanry for damages, which also failed. Um, we're nearly done. The, the unstamped press was suppressed. Um, the stamp press simply declined. In the end, the Manchester Observer finally closed in the autumn of 1822, uh, sorry, the spring of 1822, simply for lack of news, even more deadly than prosecution for a newspaper was lack of news. Economic conditions were improving and the 1820s and 30s saw a, a boom in stamp publications. And of course, in 1830, the poor man's guardian, a, a an unstamped newspaper which defied the laws against the press, as a result of this wave of unstamped publications, the reform government in, 18, in 1836, after the Great Reform Act, uh, reduced the stamp duty to a penny. Um, and this paved the way for the Chartist Northern Star, which was still priced at, I think, four pence, four pence eight, which was quite a substantial amount with, with only a penny of tax. The Northern Star had a peak circulation of 50,000 and a regular circulation of more like 
12,000 in the late 1830s and early 1840s. And both John Knight and James Rowe, who'd been involved in the Observer, um, were involved in the Chartist movement. And John, John Knight was a local agent for the Northern Star. So there's continuity here. Finally, then, the, how the Manchester Observer came to be online. One of the reporters at the Peterloo meeting, he was not a regular reporter, but an occasional correspondent to the uh, moderately loyal Manchester Chronicle, was John Edward Taylor, a Manchester cotton manufacturer, himself no friend of the radicals, but a, certainly an opponent of the town's high Tory establishment. He joined all their clubs and then did his best to, uh, to oppose uh, Toryism from the inside. He founded in May 1821 the Manchester Guardian, which actually killed the Thomas John Evans Manchester Observer. Um, it stopped being printed in Manchester after that and, and, and moved to London, as we saw. The Manchester Guardian took a lot of the advertising review, uh, revenue that the Manchester Observer would have had. It took quite a few of its readers, although the Manchester Guardian was certainly not a radical newspaper, although it was an anti-Tory newspaper. But John Edward Taylor had famously written a report of the Peterloo meeting um, and sent it to London. Uh, in order to make sure that an early report got there because the Times reporter had been arrested. So Taylor's report did appear a, a day before um, Ed, uh, before uh, Tyus's report in the Times. And this is a picture from a little bit later on of Taylor at his editor's desk, the founder of the Manchester Guardian, um, which is a, a very successful pr provincial newspaper. And he's writing an article headed Peterloo. So the, the Guardian is saying that the Peterloo radicalism is in reform is part of the Guardian's heritage. You can see underneath the table two large bound volumes of the Manchester Guardian, which suggests that this was done after a few, couple, two or three years after Rose started. But on the left, on, leaning on the chair, you can also see two other bound volumes. And I'd like you to keep an eye on those two bound volumes. This is the Manchester Guardian's offices as they were in the mid 20th century. And the mid 20th century editor uh, was A.P. Wadsworth, who was editor until the early 1960s. A.P. Wadsworth com uh, commissioned a young local historian from Manchester who lived near him, whose name was Donald Reed, to write a number of historical articles for the Manchester Guardian, including pieces on Peterloo. And when Reed decided he was actually going to write a book on Peterloo, which Reed was writing even as I was born, um, uh, Wadsworth called him into his office and lent him to the two bound volumes of the Manchester Observer which I think the Guardian must have bought up along with the, new, along with the uh, Manchester Observer's printing presses on which some of the early Guardians were printed. And here is Donald Reed from a few years ago at the, uh, with the uh, briefcase and the, the grey coat at the back of, uh, a, a, of a guided tour by the local historian Terry Wyke, who one or two of you may know. And this is on the site of Peterloo, a, a guided tour of Peterloo on the 190th anniversary. Donald Reed died just before Peterloo this year, but he did know that the Manchester Observer um, had been given uh, by me to the John Rylands Library. I should say Donald Reed delivered these two volumes of the Manchester Observer to my house when he heard that I was working on a book in Peterloo. I used them for my book and for the article which I'm trying to summarise now and then passed them to the John Rylands Library, University of Manchester. And there are those two bound volumes in my sitting room. I wonder if these are the same two volumes as we see beside John Edward Taylor, alongside those of the Manchester Guardian. The Guardian will be soon be celebrating its 200th anniversary and its radical heritage. Uh, the Guardian is now, as you may know, it's, it, it, it moved to London and became, the Manchester Guardian became the Guardian. It became first a national and then a global online newspaper. And the John Rylands Library has digitized every copy of the Manchester Observer, which is available free online at the John Rylands website, and this that you have there is the most recent address. Um, uh, it's part of the Peterloo collection, and you have to go onto about page 15 or 16 of the Peterloo collection before you find the Manchester Observer, um, but they are all there in chronological order. Unlike many online newspapers, which you have to search, which I find rather annoying, you can simply go to any issue of the Manchester Observer and start turning the pages as if you were reading the real newspaper. So in conclusion, I think it's the Manchester Observer is not just a case study in how powerful the radical press could be and also the limitations of the uh, more famous, uh, but perhaps less effective unstamped press, but its career also demonstrates the connections between provincial radicalism and London radicalism, 
and also the connections between the way the authorities in Manchester and London cooperated to use the power of the uh, the power of the authorities and the courts in the north of England uh, to prosecute newspapers in London, just as the Manchester Observer used the power of the people in the north of England to mobilise them in support of radical campaigns who were ultimately focused on Parliament in the capital. And I think there I'll finish. Thank you.